All right, welcome everybody. I'm very excited to see you all here, full room. I love all ages. Are you guys excited and ready? Yeah. Yes, I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, so I'm Allison Slaybaugh. I'm the Academic Advancement Director for the College of Science, and I am thrilled to welcome you all to the second Christmas lecture at Notre Dame. Um, we are, you guys are all in for a real treat. We've invited uh, Dr. Jordan Ellenberg here to embrace the Faraday style, um, which I will explain in a second, and um, help us unwrap the gift of science tonight. So the Christmas lecture uh, at Notre Dame was actually based off the Royal Institution of Great Britain's Christmas lecture, which has been going on for almost 200 years and is a premier series on science in the UK. It's broadcast annually on BBC and is viewed all over the world. Um, and in fact, the idea to bring it to Notre Dame came from Santiago Schnell, the William K. Warren Dean of the College of Science, uh, who in his first year said, this is something that Notre Dame needs. Uh, he was, had the privilege of experiences experiencing his first Christmas lecture as a young boy growing up in Venezuela, and he wanted to bring that magic to our South Bend community. So, you know, thanks to him, we're here tonight. Um, and I, you know, thanks to Michael Faraday, who was actually the original founder of the Christmas lecture back in the 1800s, we now have something to build on and to, and to improve and grow and embrace our community in. Uh, Michael Faraday was he did not receive a lot of formal education, but he's one of the most influential scientists of our time. He um, invented, discovered benzene and invented the Benson burner, uh, among many other things, but those I, I felt like might be most familiar to people. Uh, and it wasn't just that he was an ex exceptional scientist, he, com he conveyed his science in a way that was clear and compelling and easily understood by a lot of audiences. So he established the Christmas lecture with the goal of bringing science to the general public and inspiring the community to engage in science. There was also the secondary goal of raising money for the Royal Institution, which was also a success for him as well. Um, he not only had an artful style of, of lecturing that he kind of pioneered, you know, it was joyful, but also he insisted on demonstrating the scientific concepts that he was presenting, showing the science that he was talking about. His lectures were also you know, entertaining and also deeply philosophical. Um, he would implore his audience to understand the mechanisms of the experiments that he was conducting. He would ask, you know, we know that ice floats on water, but why does ice float? Think about it, philosophize, philosophize. <laughs> um, and so you know, as a result, we now have this Faraday style of lecture that I mentioned. And Santiago invited Dr. Ellenberg and said, are you up for the challenge to you know, come deliver the Christmas lecture in the Faraday style and embrace demonstrations in your presentation tonight? Well, Dr. Ellenberg is a mathematician who studies number theory and algebraic geometry. And if you're wondering what those things are, I will not steal his thunder, so I will let him to describe those concepts to you much more eloquently than I could anyway. Um, but the point is, is there's not a lot of hands-on demonstrations in math, and so you know, he, he's up for the challenge and he's here tonight. And it actually took the um, Royal Institution Christmas Lecture, it took them 153 years to get a mathematician to sign up for the challenge. It took us two. So we're off to a good start so far. Um, and I will say, so Dr. Ellenberg uh, was born, came from Maryland, born to a child of two statisticians and excelled in mathematics early in his childhood. He represented the U.S. in the International um, Mathematical Olympiad three times, receiving two gold medals and a silver. Not an underachiever there. Um, he received his undergrad degree from Harvard, got his master's in fiction writing from John Hopkins before going back to Harvard for his PhD in mathematics. He spent his postdoc time at Princeton and then finally joined the faculty at the University of Madison, or University of Wisconsin in Madison, where he is currently the John D. MacArthur Professor of Mathematics. So not only is he great at math, which you will see and I will learn shortly, um, he's also a well-known writer and he has been writing math concepts for general audiences for over 15 years. His work has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, uh, the Washington Post, Wired. Um, his 2014 book, How Not to be wrong. be wrong. I was like, how not to lose? No, it's how not, how not to be wrong. 
was a New York Times and Sunday Times bestseller, was one of Bill Gates' top five summer picks for books and is published in 16 countries. Um, just recently, the New York Times stated that his most recent book, Shape, made geometry entertaining. Really, it did. <laughs> So it's, uh, and if you actually, if you haven't read his work, but his face looks familiar, you might have recognized him from his 2017 cameo in the film Gifted, which he was hired on to be a mathematical consultant for. So he brings together this incredible diverse expertise in communication and mathematics that I think, you know, is really going to be a special treat for us tonight. And I'm so grateful that he's here. I'm grateful for all of you, both the viewers here and our viewers on WNIT PBS Michiana for joining in. And I, um, on behalf of the College of Science and our faculty and staff and students, I just want to, um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to give this gift of science to you tonight. And now please join me in welcoming Jordan. Okay, thank you so much. Well, thank you and thank you, Santiago, and thank you all for being here. This is, it's great to be here in South Bend. This is my second time ever being here, and I, where I learned actually that the mayor was a math major. Which is, which is great, I did not know. Um, so kids, study math, you can go far, that's, like, that's a lesson. Um, actually, I wanna be more precise. Uh, the, the mayor, Mayor Mueller, apparently went here to Notre Dame and was a triple major in math and history and philosophy. And I, I guess that's kind of the spirit in which I wanna give this talk today. So I hope uh, you, you don't expect that I'm gonna like talk about my own research and get too technical, because I am not. Um, I'm sort of here in my capacity uh, as a storyteller, because telling stories about math is sort of well, it's what I do in the classroom when I teach, and it's what I do when I like put uh, stuff together in a book. And actually, maybe I'll show you. This is a picture of the book that I just finished. <laughs> it's hard to keep this stuff straight in my head sometimes, so I have to kind of draw a little diagram to remind myself of like what's what and what's connected to other stuff. Um, I'll be covering all this today, so I hope you didn't have plans. <laughs> No, I'm going to cover like a very small, uh, maybe I'm going to sort of cover something of the upper left, but it connects to some other stuff uh, in this diagram, um, and just tell some stories. And there's going to be a demonstration, and by the way, it's a demonstration I've never tried to do before, so I just thought, why not have the first time be when it's like on TV, and if it doesn't work, it'll be just preserved for all, for all time. That seems like a good idea, so we're going to do it in the spirit, in the spirit of Faraday. Okay, so um, that said, math is about stories, but also math is about problems, so let's start with a puzzle. Um, the question is, what is this? What is this list? Kendi, Jean, Abby, Florimera, Jean, Starlo, Kaming, and Batila. Um, okay. If, you don't, if there's something that bores you and whatever else I say, like contemplate this, we'll come back to it. Um, but in order to explain the answer to this puzzle, um, I do have to start with a story, and this is where the history comes in. Okay, you're not supposed to be able to read this, by the way. Only the headline. <laughs> Mosquito Man Coming. What are we looking at here? Uh, this gentleman you see is Ronald Ross, who in 1904, when this newspaper story from the St. Louis Tribune that you're looking at uh, was printed, was one of the most famous doctors in the world. He had just won the Nobel Prize uh, for medicine uh, because he was the person who discovered that malaria was transmitted by mosquitoes. Okay, so like, right, a very, very big uh, development in, uh, in public health. Um, and he was coming to St. Louis for the Louisiana Purchase Exposition in 1904 to celebrate the 100th anniversary uh, of the Louisiana Purchase. And it actually happened 101 years earlier, but it takes a long time to put this kind of stuff together, so they were a little late. Um, and it was an incredible event. Um, Helen Keller was there speaking. Geronimo was there speaking. Some people say the ice cream cone was invented at this fair. Um, they, they, they wheeled in the Liberty Bell from Philadelphia. Did you know it moved? I actually didn't know that. <laughs> um, but they brought the Liberty Bell, and in September, there was an International Congress of Arts and Sciences, which brought uh, some of the greatest scientists and artists from all over the world to the, to the middle of America, to St. Louis, to kind of you know, sh show off this kind of new world power, to show that it was a full participant in the world's stage of learning. And one of the people who came was uh, Dr. Ronald Ross, who you see today. Um, 
And an, Ross was sort of an interesting character. Um, he was this incredibly successful doctor, but he was also like a little bit dissatisfied and never quite thought he got enough credit. I don't know if you guys know anybody like this. Um, and, he, and, and he never really sort of was that proud of his achievements in medicine. There was two things that he really esteemed, um, that he really wanted to be instead of a doctor. Uh, he wanted to be a poet, and he wanted to be a mathematician. Um, and the lecture that he delivered in St. Louis in 1904 at the International Exposition was entitled, The Logical Basis of the Sanitary Policy of Mosquito Reduction. Boy, that does not sound like it would really be a real barn burner, does it? Um, I'm going to talk about it anyway, though. Um, it also doesn't sound like it would represent the launch of an entire new field of mathematics. But in fact, that is what happened. Um, maybe I'll say one more thing to sort of give you Ross's personality. That uh, He came to deliver this talk, um, and he said in his, in his uh, memoirs later, um, the, all, all the assembled doctors were accepting a lecture on, le on medicine, and instead I gave them a lecture on mathematics, and none of them understood a word that I said, which you would think would be said in a tone of like apology, but he was quite proud, it was obvious. from the, um, <laughs> So that's who he was. Anyway, let me show you this uh, picture, which is actually a diagram from his talk. And what you're looking at here is a schematic of the lifetime of a mosquito. Okay, why was he doing this? Let me step back. Okay, once you know that malaria is spread by mosquitoes, obviously it becomes of great public health importance to be able to rid an area of mosquitoes. But the thing about mosquitoes is when you rid an area of mosquitoes, they come back, right? Um, they, they, they breed a lot, and when they breed, they breed in one place and they move to another place. So a question you might want to ask is, how long are you buying yourself? You, you clear some region, you kill the mosquitoes in whatever way you can. How long is it before that region becomes infested again? I mean, you can only clear so far somewhere on some fetid pond, like right outside the radius where you clear, there's some more mosquitoes being born, and they're eventually going to flow back into the area that you murdered all the mosquitoes in. Um, and how long does it take for them to get back? So um, Ross wanted to mathematically model this question. Um, and he made this picture because maybe you have some model where you say, well, a mosquito can fly a certain distance in a certain day. I don't know, let's say, like, I'm going to make things up, okay? Let's say a mosquito can fly a mile in a day. Is that reasonable? Probably not, but let's say that. Um, and then you might say, well, okay, so the first day the mosquito flies here, the second day the mosquito flies here, the second, third day the mosquito flies here, in five days it flies five miles. Okay, so far so good, but there's a problem, which is that, you know, mosquitoes, they're not really like goal-oriented individuals like that, right? <laughs> They're not trying to get to a certain place. And so a more accurate model of what a mosquito does is each day it wakes up and just decides what it's going to do. And then the next day it wakes up and has no memory and decides what it's going to do and flies in some completely different direction. Or maybe the same direction, I mean, just by chance. So the mosquito's path really looks much more like this. Each day it wakes up and it flies as far as it can fly, but then the next day it does something else. And as you can imagine, that means that it tends to get less far from its starting point than the more get up and go, I've got places to be, imaginary mosquito would. But how far? That's the question, right? You want to know, like, how far is that mosquito going to disperse uh, from its starting point? And this was the question that Ross talked about in St. Louis, uh, but he couldn't do it. He talked about it to say that he hadn't been able to mathematically analyze this question. Um, so what he did um, was he wrote this fellow, Carl Pearson, who was one of the great British statisticians of his time. Um, he said, can you help me out with this problem? Um, and he said, OK, I'm going to put it in a letter to nature. OK, so Nature is like an ancient British scientific journal that uh, still exists today. And remember, especially for the kids, no internet back then, right? If you want to sort of put your question in front of a lot of people, the only way to do it is to put it in the letters column of this scientific journal and hope that everybody reads it, and maybe somebody can give you an answer. Um, and Ross specifically, what, what Pearson said to Ross is, you know what, I'll, I'll print your question but I'm going to take out any mention of mosquitoes. Because if I say it's a question about biology, the mathematicians are not going to read it. They're very snobbish. We are, it's true. Um, 
<laughs> so I, I don't want to say this is a public health question or biology question. Um, I, I'm just going to take that part out. So he did so. Uh, he also took out any mention of Ross, which was extremely annoying <laughs> to Ross, who felt <laughs> poorly done once again uh, by the mathematical community. Um, so he made it just a question about a person walking. And the exact words don't matter, although this is quite uh, readable. Um, but the but one thing that Pearson did uh, by making it a question about a person walking around at random instead of a mosquito flitting around was he created this term random walk. And this is the term by which this kind of mathematical process is known even today. And here you see it uh, in its first mention. So this particular version of the question uh, did not take long to solve. In fact, it took about negative 20 years to solve, by which I mean that sort of Rayleigh, the physicist, sort of immediately wrote Pearson and was like, I, I already did this. I did this for something I was doing regarding acoustical waves. Well, acoustical waves, what does that have to do with this? Well, here's the thing about math. Every interesting mathematical concept, if it's truly deep, if it truly has something to say, has something to say in a lot of applied domains. It's very rare that a really good mathematical concept is useful for only one thing. And something kind of amazing is happening. A story that I actually only really learned when I started uh, researching for this book, which is that around 1904, 1905, 1906, people are discovering the random walk again and again in an incredible variety of contexts and for an incredible variety of reasons. And boy, I could just tell this story at great length, but I've got other places to go today. We've got to solve this puzzle. So uh, let me just, I'll just briefly start here. So. Uh, who are we looking at? Um, on the upper left, you have Robert Brown, who's a botanist in the early 19th century. And he discovers a phenomenon called Brownian motion. I'll bet some of you guys have heard of it, which is that if you have what well, he discovered, it, he was a botanist, so he was looking at pollen. And he noticed that pollen, if you look at it in a microscope, in like a sort of, in a fluid, like in a vial of water, it kind of like jitters around. <laughs> He was like, what's going on? And you know, at first he thought, well, even though the pollen is off the plant, it still has like some kind of vitality, a kind of something of the living creature it was part of still persists, and it's sort of like rummaging around uh, inside this vial of water. But he was a good scientist, so he's like, I should try this with other things besides pollen. And he quickly realized that if you put something that wasn't alive, if you put, you know, he just tried different things he had in the lab, oh, like a piece of dust from his windowsill or like a piece of charcoal, he found that it didn't matter what the particle was made of. Actually, my favorite part of this is he's listing the things he puts in the water to see if they move. And he says, and, and one of the things he's like, a fragment of the sphinx. Why the hell, like that was a normal thing to have sitting around in your lab. He makes no comment on it. This is very strange, and I've always wanted to unravel this mystery of why he had a fragment of the Sphinx in his biological laboratory. But I can tell, according to Brown, if you put the fragment of the Sphinx in a little vial of water, it'll jitter around, just like a piece of pollen. Okay, so now you know. Um, <laughs> Anyway, it was a complete mystery why this was happening. He had ascertained it was not because of any vital principle that the pollen maintained. Um, remember, at this time, people really don't know what the microstructure of matter is like. But one popular theory was that what was going on was that inside the water, there were like tiny particles, what we would now call molecules, which were just like moving around at titanic speed. And every once in a while, one of them would bump into the pollen and make it move in some random direction. OK, so does that start to sound familiar? Like, this is exactly the model of what the mosquito is doing, that just like every so often, for some reason, it chooses a random direction to go and just goes. Um, but of course, one couldn't at this time see water molecules. One could just try to infer that they were there. And one way to test this was to say, how would the, the pollen behave if this theory of what we're driving its motion were right, same as the mosquito? Um, and then you could sort of look at whether its behavior actually was in agreement with that. Uh, who did that? This guy? Who's, this is the one person I think you might recognize in this slide. Who is this? But it's not the usual picture. It's Einstein, right? But it's young Einstein. It's like 1905, cool Einstein. I, he was cool old, too. But I mean, but this is, this is Einstein at about the age he was when he uh, successfully like, analyzed Brownian motion and showed that the sort of mathematical model exactly matched what was visible in the experiment, which was a decisive blow in favor of the molecular theory of matter. So, this mathematical model was discovered again by Einstein in Switzerland in the context of physics. Um, and meanwhile, there's this fellow, Louis Bachelier. I don't know if this is a name. I, I actually heard that half of Notre Dame undergraduates major in business. Is that true? 
So any of the business majors in the room know Louis Bachelier? I see one, I see a hand in the back, fantastic. So Bachelier is sort of, in some sense, the inventor of modern finance, although actual finance people like, didn't really catch on to what Bachelier was doing until like, uh, you know, 50 years after this. And in 1905, what's he doing? He's a student in Paris in mathematics who's like, I want to analyze the behavior of bond prices in the bourse, which is the big Paris market, and what if they were just randomly going up and down? What would those prices do? By the way, I know I said this again about, I know I said this about mathematicians being snobs, I'm going to say it again. It really took some convincing that this was a thing that could be mathematically studied and that you could get a degree in math for doing. Very unlike today, but in Paris at the time, like, stock prices? Like, really? We're supposed to be studying, like, planetary motions and stuff like that. But he did convince his mentor, Poincaré, that this was actually a good idea. Wait, can I say one more thing about this? This is him at age 20. Can you believe that? Okay, sorry, I just thought that was crazy. Um, Anyway, so um, Bachelier finds, just as Einstein did, that this mathematical model of the random walk very accurately described uh, what was going on in markets, and he wrote this, uh, which would much later become very influential thesis, saying that as far as we know, uh, prices of equities in a market are essentially following a random walk, just like the mosquito. And this is my little picture of Brownian motion, of what something looks like if it's sort of a sort of more up-to-date computer-generated picture of this slide that Ronald Ross had in his talk in St. Louis. So in finance, in physics, in biology, we see this same thing being invented again and again. But we don't call a random walk a Ross process, and we don't call it an Einstein process, and we don't call it a Bachelier process. Um, we call it after this gentleman, Andrei Markov. So a Markov process is probably what we most commonly call a random walk in mathematics today. And Markov's interest in the random walk came from perhaps the strangest application of all. Uh, he was trying to win a theological argument with his enemy, Nekrasov. So Markov and Nekrasov were completely different. Nekrasov uh, is in Moscow, and he's like an arch conservative Russian Orthodox. Markov is uh, an atheist and a reformer. Um, in fact, he, he really spent a lot of time writing angry letters to the newspaper. And was, he, was called Mark, he was called Andre the Furious. That was his nickname. <laughs> he demanded, like when, like when Tolstoy was excommunicated, he got very mad and demanded that he should also be excommunicated. Because <laughs> he felt he was just as much of a heretic as, as Tolstoy. And he was, by the way. He was, um, he got, or, there was a deal, they wouldn't give him an anathema, which is what he really wanted, but he was successfully uh, self-excommunicated. But, um, so, wh so why was he having this argument? Well, I could go into this at length, but I'm not gonna, because that's not what tonight's talk is about. Um, but there's a famous theorem called the law of large numbers, proved by Jacob Bernoulli. Um, and whether or not you know the theorem, you know the effect. It says that if you flip a coin a bunch of times, the percentage of time is going to come heads is with very high probability going to convert to something very close to one half. Like it would be extremely weird if you flipped a coin a thousand times and 60% of the time it came up heads, like assuming it's a fair coin. But for that to work, for that theorem to work, you need to know that the coin flips are independent of one another. Um, like if something about the coin made it so that if it came up heads once, it was more likely to came, come up heads the next time, the law of large numbers wouldn't apply. So there's some relation between these statistical regularities um, and independence. And Nekrasov wrote a very long paper arguing that because human behavior is subject to statistical regularities, just like the flips of a coin. I mean, this was something that was really, really interesting to people in the 19th and early 20th century, that you know, if you look at people's heights or people's uh, age of marriage or people's recidivism or of crimes or whatever, that these proportions sort of tend to be pretty stable over time just like the results of a bunch of coin flips. Um, so he wrote a long paper arguing that this meant, by the law of large numbers, um, that people's actions were independent of each other, and thus that people had free will in exactly this, the way required by the dogma of the Russian Orthodox Church. And Markov was very unhappy with this. Not so much because he had an objection to the religion, it's because he had an objection to, to math being used <laughs> in this way, which he called an abuse of mathematics. So he was, so he, he was very unhappy, and he made it his business to show um, 
that you could have these statistical regularities without the independence. And so let me make a, another little picture. Um, this is another version of the story of the mosquito, okay? Um, I'm gonna simplify his life right a lot. I'm gonna say he only has two bogs that he can live in, bog zero and bog one. And maybe he likes bog zero a little more. So if he's in bog zero one day, 90% chance he's gonna stay. 10% chance he's gonna stay, he's gonna jump to bog one. If he's in bog one, he likes that a little less, there's actually a 20% chance he's gonna jump over to bog zero, and an 80% chance he's gonna stay put. So the point Markov made, well, what Markov proved is that a mosquito that does this, it will settle down to a very predictable percent of the time that the mosquito is gonna spend over here versus how much time the mosquito is gonna spend over here, just like the coin flips. Except, of course, that where the mosquito is one day is not at all independent from where he's gonna be the next day. It's very likely to be the same place. So this was his way of sort of basically completely knocking down uh, Nekrasov's attempt uh, to mathematically uh, uh, enforce like his theological opinions. But Markov didn't stop there. You know, what are, not to be stereotypical, but like what are Russian people really interested in? Like theological arguments and poetry, <laughs> right? Fair, anyone, okay. So, so he immediately moved on uh, to, to, to studying Pushkin and he was like, you know, you can do the same thing. He took, he took um, Eugene Onegin, this very famous sort of uh, long poem of Pushkin's, and laboriously wrote out the first 10,000 letters in Russian marking which one was a consonant and which one was a vowel. Uh, and then um, he made a little diagram just like the bog and found that if a letter was a consonant, the chance was about two-thirds that the next letter was a vowel and about one-third that there would be another consonant. And if it was a vowel, so vowel, vowel was quite rare, right? If it was a vowel, it was like unlikely there was like another vowel, and then much more likely you would flip to a consonant. And he got very interested in this. He actually did this with like another like Russian novelist and found that this Markov process looked rather different. Um, so that you can in some sense distinguish these two authors like just from the pattern of consonants and vowels, which seems like a very meager amount of information. But again, we see this concept of the random walk just expanding out because it's a good concept into like a crazy array of application domains. Now, I will say that this didn't become like a major form of literary criticism post <laughs> Markov, but something very interesting did happen because, and this is an insight that I think was first due to Claude Shannon. So I'm jumping forward a bit, right? Everything I just told you was all this amazing stuff that's happening at the exact same time in 1905 and 1906. Now I'm jumping forward to the 40s with Claude Shannon, an early an, uh, sort of mathematician and early computer scientist who's sort of developing information theory. And he makes a rather amazing observation, which is that we can think of this picture as a way to analyze the poetry of Pushkin, or we can think of it as a way to make fake Pushkin poetry. Which is to say, I just sort of say, okay, my first letter is a consonant, and then I sort of, you know, flip a weighted coin and figure out with two-thirds chance I go here and put down a vowel, and with a 33% chance I sort of put down another consonant. Now, I didn't tell you which consonant, so this is like a little bit impoverished. Um, I guess I could just pick a consonant like B and a vowel like A, and then my poem would be like ba 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 whatever, some kind of Dadaistic thing. Um, well, you know, Markov could do no more than this because he didn't have a computer, right? I mean, he had to sort of like write down 10,000 letters by hand. Um, today, we can do much more. And so Shannon's realization was that if you did a more energetic version of this, where instead of just two bogs, you had 26 bogs, every English letter, or even better, pairs of English letters or triples of English letters, you could actually use this to generate something that looked like artificial English text. And we're going to do it, or at least we're going to try. We're going to play the Shannon game, this sort of game that Shannon invented. So uh, I need something to write on. And while I'm getting this ready, what I want from you guys is I need sources of random text. So some of you guys have, a, if you have like a book or a newspaper, or if not, just like pull up your phone to sort of something with a large amount of text. I just need lots of random letters. Uh, I really wonder if this is gonna work. I hope so. Okay, so here's what I need. I just want one person, we gotta start this somewhere. So I just want one person to look at a random page of whatever you're looking at and just tell me the first two letters you see in order. 
Z-O, okay, great. And by the way, if one of the letters is a space, like tell me that too, like if we hit the end of a word, tell me, okay. So I need another pair of letters, but I need it to start with O. So everybody look for something, and the first person to see a pair of letters that starts with O, tell me, Ravens. O-R, okay, so now I need something that starts with R. R-S. Oh, you, oh, you are looking, okay, I'm just making sure, no cheating, like you can't make, you can't just pick one you like, you gotta actually look in the text. Okay, so R-S, so now I need something that starts with S. S-E, okay. E F, okay. F dot. F dot, okay. Zorsef. Let's, this is fun. Let's do a, let's do a little bit more. Okay, so now we now I need one. We're gonna do two letters, but it's, remember we just had a period, so it's gotta be something that's like after starting a word. Oh, I want the kid. A B, okay. So now I need something starting with B. B R. Okay, something starting with R. Yeah, what's yours? R, R K, okay. Um, and how about something starting with K? This should take a little longer, right? K is a rarer letter. K-E. K-E. Okay, something starting with E? E-Y. E-Y. Okay. Uh, oh, something starting with a Y, another rare letter, yeah. Wait, what? Y-M. Y-M, okay. I got it, I got it. I know Notre Dame, I got it. Okay, um. <laughs> okay, now I need something starting with M. M E, um, and and an E, yeah. E F. That's our second E F. Interesting. Okay. F O. F O. Nobody said the end of a word yet. I'm getting nervous. Okay. Um. O L. O L. Okay. L space. L space. Okay. All right. That's a good. That's a good amount. That's a good amount. Okay. So what we just did is play the Shannon game. This worked pretty well. Uh, a group of two letters is called a bigram, and he would actually like, do this in his library. He would walk around. Now, he did it with trigrams. So there, if we'd done that, if somebody said Z-O-R, we would have had to go and find one that started with O-R, and then, although this went so fast, I wasn't sure how fast it would go. Now I'm like, maybe we should have done it, but that's okay. Um, so with two letters, you see that it produces something that kind of has something in common with English text. Like, these are not words, but Zorsef at least sounds like it sort of is Englishy. You, you see the problem with two letters in that this aberk is hard to say because, right, we did this BR, but then the R didn't remember that there was a B before it, and so it gave me another consonant. That can happen. But then the rest of it sounds pretty good, like, right, aberk came a fall. It's not bad. Um, yes, exa exactly. We accidentally, somebody had a book in Welsh, obviously. That's what happened. <laughs> So what we did is, you know, we didn't really have access to this full Markov process, but we had a way of sort of um, randomly sampling from the English language, just using you guys and your various texts as my, as my random sampler. Um, so this is the famous saying that Shannon put in his paper. He used trigrams for this. He used three-letter sequences and sort of played this game, and he wrote in his paper, in noist lat way, cradict fror burs grossed pondinome of demonstrators of the reptigen is regoactiona of Cree. <laughs> Stirring words. <laughs> but I hope you can see that this is a little more Englishy than when we did it with two-letter sequences, right? And the longer the sequences you do, uh, the more of the features of English you capture. But of course, you pay a price, which is that if you were doing like five letter sequences, it might take you a long time in your library to find uh, four letters in a row that match the last four, four letters that you're trying to find the new one of. So guess what? I'm ready to reveal the answer to the puzzle. Because you can train a system like this on any random selection of the English language you want. Shannon was using his library in his house. I was using whatever you guys had open on your phone while you were supposed to be listening to my talk or like whatever it was. Um, but you can use anything. And for instance, a, a, an experiment that I did that I thought would be fun is to train it on the list of every baby name given in the United States like in a given year. And so that's what I did. And you can see the results right here. And, um, so I did it with babies born in 1971, which happens to be the year I was born, and I did it with um, pairs of letters 
bigrams, triples of letters, that's what we started with, and then pentuples of letters, tuples of five letters. And you see something very interesting, which is that for only two letters, the names don't quite sound as namey, do they? Like um, Tiendola, Ambarilon, Madra Hadria, I think that's my favorite on that list. <laughs> Kasaniang, Quill, and Abinellit. Um, with three letters, the names start to get a little more namey, but one thing that happens is sometimes it's actually picking out real names, like Abby. Because if it sees the trigram ABB, that, that double B is not gonna appear in very many names. So it's not actually surprising that it looks around and finds that Y, which is actually coming from maybe the same place that ABB was coming from. And then if you sort of do sequences of five letters, you're really seeing a lot of actual names with sort of some things that are sort of names mixed together. And what's cool about that, I mean, this stuff is endless fun, you guys. Um, what's cool about this is you can train it on a different data set, as you see here, and if you train it on 2017 names, you know, you get names like Anaki, Emily, Elif, Branchy, Naviel, L Luxton is, I think, the most 2017 name <laughs> on that list. Um, and maybe Ryerson is also a good one. Um, whereas if you do it for babies born in 1917, you get like Vency, Adele, Wanda Liotl, uh, some real names like Catherine, Ernet, Carlos, Hezelia, and Oberta. Well, wouldn't you agree that like, there is something kind of 1917 about those names? <laughs> And there is something 2017 about the 2017 names, even though these things were produced completely randomly uh, from a Markov process. So whatever those kind of, I mean, if I drew a picture of the bogs, I would have to draw, let's see, like 26 cubed bogs in order to keep track of all the trigrams, and there would be a lot of them. But somehow that list of numbers is actually capturing something about the style of names being given in those eras. And I always find it quite alchemical and magical that this actually works. And of course, we are in a moment now, and I'm gonna kind of like close on this, where so-called large language models are being talked about a lot. These kind of rather miraculous computer programs that can produce a rather good approximation of English text artificially, much better than this. But it's much better than this, in some, it's much better than this but in some sense it's the same. That's what I wanna emphasize. The kind of mindless process that produces this artificial text um, has many more parameters than the pictures I drew on this page in the hundreds of billions instead of just a few thousand. Um, but it's fundamentally doing the same kind of thing, taking in like a large body of existing English text and trying to figure out what's likely to come after what, and then sort of auto-generating just the way we all did together when we made, I already forgot, Zarlef or whatever word it was that we made. <laughs> so these are just basically much, much, much bigger Zarlef machines. Um, and I'll give an example because it's kind of uh, striking. Of course, as, as you all do, like, like when, you first, when Google was first invented, of course you first search for yourself, right? So the first thing I did was to sort of try to ask one of these large language models to like talk like me. I sort of fed it like part of my own book and was like, okay, now complete it and see what it says. Um, and it's pretty impressive, right? I mean, the geometric objects are everywhere. They can be found in our homes and our cars and the walls of museums and even inside. I mean, the most common, I mean, this doesn't sound exactly like me, but it's like, it's okay. But I, mean, I think what's impressive to me is where the, what it, the closing here, but squares aren't just shapes, they're also numbers. That's pretty cool, right? Because you guys know that a square number is a kind of integer that's like a number multiplied by itself. It's pretty cool that it came up with that. But I also want to emphasize, I, I actually cut this run off a little bit early. Um, here's what it said next. Um, <laughs> You know, the number you get by adding the length of the four sides, that's not right. And then it's like, I'm just going to double down. That's right, one plus four equals two. <laughs> um, and then the number, that's a, the sum of the four sides is somehow the area of the square. Okay, so it's, I mean. <laughs> so I, I think we're at a really fascinating moment. Something that is a Markov process, fundamentally no different from this fleeting, fleeting mosquito uh, that I drew from you at the beginning, can on the one hand produce this astonishing imitation of English text, but which also sort of like on some level clearly doesn't know what it's saying. I guess that's the philosophy part of the talk that we can talk about, like what it even means to know what it's saying. Um, but there's certain kinds of things that a Markov process can do and certain kinds of things that a Markov process probably can't. And um, where those boundaries are, well, that's the thing about math. There's a lot more that we don't know than that we do know, uh, and that's something that we don't know. But I'm just gonna leave this here and then leave it on this uh, slide with this sort of big picture. So 
what did we hit? I think we hit the St. Louis Exposition, Ronald Ross, um, God was in there a little bit, there's Markov and Carl Pearson. So we sort of talked about this part of the, of the story. So thank you guys so much for coming and I'm happy to take questions for as long as you guys wanna ask them. Well, well, that depends on the reader, doesn't it? <laughs> because different people say that's good to different things. So, I, I mean, I have been playing a lot with these large language models. Um, and I will say this, actually, I have a kind of good, like, uh, caveat emptor for this stuff. Because what you're gonna see, and maybe if you're on social media, you've seen it a lot, you will see a lot of really impressive results that people post, like, oh, I sort of gave the machine this prompt and it came out with this like very, very factually correct, like very authoritative, very like human sounding response. Um, never believe that. Well, don't, don't not believe it, but you gotta remember that the most impressive responses are gonna be the ones that get the most uptake and are shared the most, right? So there's sort of like a bias in what you actually see. I highly recommend, because now these systems are either very cheap or completely free, play with it yourself, because if you do, even for an hour, you'll at the same time, you'll be incredibly impressed by what that can do, but also you'll very quickly encounter its limitations. You'll very quickly see what it can't do. And in particular, I would say at the moment, um, because in some sense they're trained on some huge corpus of English text scraped from the internet, it's kind of, by its very nature, producing like very average text. So it's very easy for it to produce something that sounds like it was made by a human and very hard for it to make something that sounds like it was produced by an interesting human. <laughs> <laughs> But again, for some applications, that's like completely, I'm just going to say it, I'm writing a lot of recommendations letters right now, it's appealing, not going to lie. <laughs> because you're not supposed to be interesting, you're just supposed to sort of turn some set of information you have into sort of some passable array of English text and like, you know. Um, so, so no, I mean, but to answer your actual question, um, let me say this. The, the, the Dadaist poets, I mentioned them before when I was talking about consonants and vowels, certainly believed that there was some value in what they, what they called aleatory literature, where they would just do random things and then like put random syllables together and, and say them at their clubs and people would listen to them and enjoy them. And so they, they certainly believed in this idea that um, there can be an injection of randomness without any sort of human consciousness behind it can produce something that you can value as art, but I think maybe only one kind of art. So I think it would be limited in like what kind of poems and what kind of novels it could write, if that makes sense. Like we don't listen to Dada poetry that much, like maybe like once a year is enough for most people. <laughs> this diagram is in the book. This is the book I already wrote. It's, it's supposed to be like, you know, do, do any of you guys read like fantasy novels? And you know at the beginning of the fantasy novel there's like a big map where it's like the goblins live over here and then there's like the evil mountains of darkness over here. It's supposed to be like that. Like that was my, that was my inspiration for putting that picture in the, in, the, in the beginning of the book. It is not limited to English at all. I only use it in English because that's the only kind of text I know how to judge uh, whether it looks like that language. Um, I'm not an expert in this but I think because it's trained on a gigantic internet corpus I think if you sort of prompt it to sort of talk to you in Slovenian, like it'll do that, but also because uh, the preponderance of English on the internet is so great, I would guess that it's best at English. I mean, usually the sort of more data they have to train on, the better they perform, and a, and a smaller language, it's just gonna have less to work with. So like I personally, for a language I didn't understand, no, no chance. Like if I saw like a sequence of Chinese characters that was like actually Chinese versus a sequence of Chinese characters that it could be produced by a much less sophisticated system than this and I still wouldn't be able to tell. <laughs> I mean, could you? Like how? I think it's an interesting question if it were a language I had some acquaintance with like Spanish but didn't really speak. I don't know, Pro probably something as good as GPT-3 I think would fool me, so yeah. I mean, wh I mean what I would say is that in essence, and this is kind of like one of the, um, all of the process, all of the of progress in artificial intelligence, machine learning, neural nets, whatever you want to call it, um, it is amazing, but it's important to emphasize, and this is one of the things I write about in the book actually, that 
it's not exactly new. It's more like a much bigger version of things we already were doing. So I mean, one of the points I want to make is that um, a, a language model like this is not so different from a very simple Markov chain like what Markov wrote down. It's just much, 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 much bigger because we have abilities to compute that we didn't have in Markov's time or even 10 years ago. So, so yeah, I mean, I think what you're seeing here, that, that is like what's built into like the, um, the machine learning applications that are being developed right now. They're trying to learn those numbers I put on the bogs. They're trying to learn, okay, if I, have, if I see this sequence of 20 words, what's the probability that the next word is frog? You know, probably pretty low, depending on what the words are about, but like, <laughs> And there's, as you can imagine, there's sort of some huge array of numbers that you have to uh, be able to estimate in order to do that, but that's what they're trying to do. Oh, that's a good question. So here's what I do. I write a book proposal that says what the book is gonna be about, and then I send it to the publisher, and they're like, that sounds cool, write that. Uh, and then I start writing and realize I'm like completely bored with all the stories I already know. <laughs> but then I find out about some other stuff, like while I'm researching, that I'm much more excited about, and then I write that instead. So it's a little bit, I don't know if that's the best way <laughs> to do it, but, um, but basically it is this process of like, you know, you research one thing. I mean, I think, wh where did it even start with this one? Oh, actually, I know where it started. It started because I was supposed to be writing this book and I was like way behind on it. And then there was a pandemic. I don't know if you heard. And, um, <laughs> and so I was like obsessively like reading about that. And I was reading about, um, you know, the models of epidemic growth and decay, which were developed first by who? Ronald Ross, together with the algebraic geometer Hilda Hudson, um, who I also like, didn't know about before. There was this interesting collaboration, which I do write about in the book, between this biologist and, this, and a pure mathematician. Um, so then I was reading Ross's memoirs because of that, and then I like, found out about, uh, you know, went back to the mosquito stuff, and then you know, the more you read, the more you find out about some other story that's connected to that. I mean, in some ways, like book writing, what it has in common with mathematics is that there's all these ostensibly different parts, right? You, you major in math, or even just you take math, and there's like, you take algebra, and then you take geometry, and then you take trigonometry, and then you take calculus, and they, you know, as if these were different things, but actually they are all connected to each other like very tightly. And writing a book is kind of like that, right? You sort of like, all these stories look different, but they're connected under the skin. And then I draw these pictures to kind of remind myself which things that I, I think have to do with which other things. Why is Abraham Lincoln on my chart? Because I discovered something else I didn't know before I started writing this book, that he was a lover of geometry. He, was, he, uh, he kind of had like a crisis of faith. You know, Lincoln, um, he ran for Congress, he lost, he was depressed, he was like kind of going around just being like a regular country lawyer. And he, uh, he gives this interview where he says, you know, every day I was going into the courtroom and being asked to like prove my case. And I was like, I don't, I don't even know what that means. What, is it, what are they asking me to do? What does prove mean? I'm not gonna be able to do this job as a lawyer until I go like, read all six books of Euclid and can understand all the proofs. And then I'll know what it means <laughs> to prove something. And he, and he did it. I mean, he's a very interesting character. Um, and, so, um, and so that's why I found myself writing about him. He, um, he got very interested in the sort of classical Greek problem of squaring the circle, uh, which is actually impossible. That's why we use that as like a sort of synonym for a difficult task. Um, and he tried really, really, but at that time, in, in the 19th century, it wasn't known that it was impossible. So he tried like really, really hard to do it, and his law partner who like, you know, wrote his memories of Lincoln, like wrote about how like he was supposed to be doing work for the law firm, but he was just constantly like had all these colored pencils and was like drawing all these diagrams, and he had his compass and his straight edge out, and was trying to do it. And then like after about three days, they were all gone, and we could tell that he'd failed, but he clearly didn't want to talk about it, so we just let it go. <laughs> so I feel like, I, I mean, I, I have to say, I mean, I always, I'm a Lincoln fan, like, who's not? But, like, to me, I actually, this was a very human Lincoln that I found very relatable. Like, I liked about him that he was ambitious enough to try his hand at this very famous problem, which many, many, many people before him had failed to do, but also kind of had the self-knowledge to at some point be like, nope, it beat me like it beat everybody else. Like, as opposed to other people who sort of spend their lives insisting that they solved it because they sort of couldn't handle the thought that maybe they couldn't do it. So that's, 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 that's how uh, Lincoln came in. But a perfect example of something I had no idea about before I was, I don't even remember how I came across it, but I was um, probably just writing about, reading about Euclid, I found out about that. It was similarly disorganized. 
<laughs> what I remember, and it's a long time ago, but definitely writing a novel for me. The, pr the problem is that a nonfiction book, you can kind of write it in any order and then figure out what connects with what and what needs to be before what, and you can put it in the order at the end. A, 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 a novel, you, you kind of have to write in order, but then if you're me, then about, by about halfway through, you're like, oh, now I see how the beginning like, should have gone. <laughs> And then you just have to kind of like write through to the end and then start over and make the beginning match what you now know the end is supposed to be. So again, I'm not sure that's the optimal process. I mean, I only did it once. Um, but so in, in that way, in that way it was similar. <laughs> yeah, so the questioner, you know, asked, aren't humans much more efficient? And like, definitely. So that is one thing that these large language models can do incredible things, but they have to read the entire internet to do it. Like, we don't. <laughs> um, we, you know, and, and we shouldn't try. Sometimes it feels like we are, but um, uh, yeah, way in the back. I, yeah, I mean, one thing I write about in the book that I do take seriously is that I want to kind of get past this model of the AI getting ahead of us, because I consider that kind of like a linear model where all forms of intelligence are kind of on a line, and we can compare any two to see like which is ahead. I actually think that probably, um, you know, and if the AIs like learn to like dominate us, then like, you know, I won't be here to like, for you to tell me I was wrong. Um, I think that probably the machines are gonna be very good at certain kinds of tasks and we're gonna be very good at certain other kinds of tasks and there will be collaboration, which in, this, in a way, is the entire history of technology already, like cars are much better than us at going 60 miles an hour. It doesn't mean we don't mean people, but there are certain tasks they're like super good at that we're bad at, and even like intellectual tasks. I mean, you know, in the history of math, we have been using technology for a long time, and there are certain things that in 1890 you could get a PhD for doing, which now we would say is just a computation, because now the computer can do it. But there are still Mathematicians, I mean, the history so far is that the machines learn to do certain things and take them off our hands, and then we kind of like, that helps us like race ahead. So, you know, the safest prediction to make is always whatever's been happening will keep happening. It's not always true, but it's the way to bet. <laughs> what, uh, what, well, what happened to, um, what happened do the mosquitoes, that they're like still around, still giving people malaria? I don't know, like we're better at, um, what happened to Markov is uh, there was a revolution in Russia not long after that that you might have heard about. And you'd think that Markov would have been like tickled pink, right? Because now the sort of atheistic communists like took over and created the Soviet Union. But he was just like that guy, right? He was just as unpleasant to the Soviet authorities as he had been to the church authorities. Um, and he was not really like persecuted, but he also like didn't really find favor with uh, with the new bosses after the revolution. I mean, I think at the very shortly before his death, I think he was complaining. Uh, somehow they sent him a pair of shoes for like his great service to Russian mathematics, and he wrote like a long letter about the sort of inferior <laughs> production of the Soviet shoe factory that had <laughs> that had made them these shoes. So so. so so Markov is a good example of, yeah, sometimes things just kind of stay the same as they have, as they have been. That's, that's who he was. Yes, way, way in the back. So I asked them if it had to be about Christmas. Oh, let me repeat the question. Oh, I'm supposed to be repeating all the questions. Why didn't anybody yell at me to repeat the questions? Okay. Um, so the, the question was, what does this have to do with Christmas? I did specifically ask if it was supposed to be about Christmas, and they said it didn't have to be about Christmas, and I was like, why isn't it on Christmas? And they were like, you asked too many questions. Like, so, <laughs> um, <laughs> so really, maybe I should take it as a challenge to the audience. Can anybody like devise like a Christmas theme of like what this talk has to do with Christmas? I got nothing. Well, if there are no more questions, so now is my time to, uh, to speak briefly. So my name is Santiago Schnell and the William K. Uh, uh, Warren Dean of the College of Science. So, and I want to thank you all for coming here today. I think it has been a fantastic lecture, as well as want to thank those who are watching online and in our local PBS station. But more importantly, I want to thank Jordan. So he has done an outstanding job. You. And you know, one of our goals with the Christmas lecture so, is that we want to unwrap the magic of science. 
And today was something certainly magic about how our language is connected with random processes. Although it's not perfect, the connection, we can see something that we didn't know most of us before. And that's the goal of the Christmas lecture. Thank you.